Abraham Lincoln, our 16th president, said, no man is poor who has had a godly mother. The next quote, you will recognize probably the quote and not know where it came from, but obviously I'm here to help with that. Um, the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. Anybody want to guess who wrote that? William Ross, William Ross Wallace, who I found it this week. It's not only a 19th century poet, American poet, but he was born in Lexington, Kentucky. Rudyard Kipling was a name that I began to hear when I was uh, in high school, but heard it a lot more when I was in college majoring in literature. He's an early 20th century writer and novelist, poet. You will recognize his name maybe from the book, The Man Who Would Be King. And he said it this way. He said, if I were hanged on the highest hill, I know whose love would follow me still. Mother of mine, mother of mine. If I were drowned in the deepest sea, I, would know, I know whose tears would come down to me. Mother of mine, mother of mine. If I were damned of body and soul, I know whose prayers would make me whole. Mother of mine, mother of mine. You don't know the historical context out of which we celebrate Mother's Day. It is from some lady by the name of Anna Jarvis. She first suggested the national observance of an annual day honoring mothers because she loved her mother so dearly. So, Miss Jarvis gave a carnation, her mother's favorite flower, to each person who attended the service upon her mother's death in May the 10th, 1908. And within the next few years, the idea of a day to honor mothers gained popularity. And so Mother's Day on May the 9th, 1914, was in fact an act of Congress under President Woodrow Wilson. And now it is officially the second Sunday in May, and it's identified as Mother's Day. For some of you who followed through, if you are a if your mother is living, you oftentimes are given a red carnation, and if they have been since passed, then it is a white carnation. But today we look at a passage that we almost always look at at Christmas. Now, if you were raised in the Catholic Church, you hear of Mary more often, but in the Protestant Church, we typically only bring Mary out and talk a lot about her around Christmas time, but today it's an appropriate thing for us to do. You can go back in the Old Testament and you can find all kinds of mothers with which you could pay respect. There's Hagar, there's mothers, there's Moses' mothers, there's Rizpah, and certainly one that most all of us would know is Hannah. We looked, I, looked, I did an overview of all of those, but it's Mary that we will land on today. And I want you to look, if you've got your worship folder, want to follow along in the bulletin there, the first scripture we're going to look at is one that we have read and heard about many times, and it's where... Mary, the mother of Jesus, his mother treasured all these things in her heart. Now, what's that treasuring part there? The treasuring part is what I would call wholehearted living. Now, I get that term not because I'm creative, but because uh, Brene Brown has a book entitled The uh, Gifts of Imperfection. And there she talks about what it is that she calls wholehearted living. Hearing that term more and more, let me give you a little bit of a perspective about what she calls wholehearted living. She says it's about engaging our lives from a place of worthiness. It means cultivating three things, courage, compassion, and connection. And she's probably right. And I think as I look back on my own mother and as I look back, look uh, into my own wife as she is, had mothered our children, there is a certain sense of balance between knowing that they are not perfect and then believing that even at our worst, we still are able to be who we need to be into the future. How many times do you think Mary had moments in her life when she was overwhelmed by being Jesus' mother? And yet out of a certain sense of weakness, she gained what Paul would later call strength and weakness. So if you want to follow along, first point is notice Mary's keen spiritual insight. it would not have been easy to raise Jesus. It just wouldn't. Imagine having a 12-year-old son who disappears for three days, and when you find him, he simply says, why is it that you're looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? Now, I don't know about you, but I don't really care what 
call of God. He's feeling at 12 years old. If I was his parent, I would find that slightly unusual. But there he was, always pushing ahead. And again, it's the perfect balance of who he was, human, who he was, God, and the self-realization process that was going along in him knowing that. Mary was often, often called herself the handmaid of the Lord. Now what that literally means is that she believed that her primary task in all the world was simply to instill in her son a faith that would be strong enough to withstand whatever might come his way. And believe me, a lot came his way. When we think about uh, being mothers and fathers today, we think about certain things that we ought to want to give to our children there are things like we want them to have a good education, we want them to be able to have, uh, w to be well dressed, the material things of life, we want them to be, you know, at least minimally popular, and then we would think, well, that's kind of a success. But I will tell you that the modern definition of success does not, in fact, provide what we really need to know and what a mother really wants and desires for their children. I mean, physically attractive, sure, intellectually sharp, why not, socially acceptable, but how about spiritually bankrupt? What is it that we need to give to our children to make sure that they, in fact, will not be spiritually bankrupt? Now, I watched the eyes of these children. The, the thing that lit me up this morning was when they sang, they were living that moment. I mean, those children, you know, when they would do their arms and they would sing the song and do the motion, there was something about that moment where they were connecting it and for the first I, I saw very little hey mom and dad how you doing out there you know they would you know I give it to Sarah Sarah probably I don't know if she threatened them or what she did to them but I mean they were paying attention and they were stirring an experience into their lives that was incredibly moving to me Peter Marshall, um, for some of you who've been around movies a long time in your life, there was a movies back in the 1950s. Now, back then, they actually gave preachers the benefit of the doubt, and one of these uh, movies was a man called Peter, and it was his wife's story about his life. He was a preacher. He was a Presbyterian pastor of a, of a church in Washington, D.C., and Peter Marshall was very, obviously, very popular in his life, and when his wife published the book, which later became a movie, actually was, uh, was nominated for an Academy Award, it was a very powerful book. But one of the day, one of the many Sundays he preached, he preached about, obviously, women on Mother's Day. And he gave this quote that was very powerful to me when I was reading this week. He says, if you have no prayer life yourself, it's rather useless gesture to make your child say their prayers at night. If your church does not mean anything to you, it is rather futile for you to send your child to Sunday school. If you make a practice of telling social lies, it will be difficult for you to, in fact, make your child be truthful. If you say cutting things about your neighbors or your fellow church members, it would be hard for your child to learn the meaning of kindness. And then finally, he says, the 20th century challenge to motherhood is when it's all boiled down is that mothers, quote, and fathers, he puts in there, must have an experience of God, a faith that will pass on to their children. Peter Marshall was right. You and I can go around this world and we can see the great trade centers. We can see the industrial centers of our world. We can go to Washington, D.C. and see the legislative halls of whatever it is they do sometimes. And we can go to schools. But ultimately, at the end of the day, what matters the most to children are their homes. And that's the most powerful place. Christian parenting is still the most greatest, highest, noblest profession, vocation there is in the world. If you don't believe that, you know, I love it when science confirms what scripture tells us. And it, it happens really pretty regularly. There's a book out called Give and Take. And I didn't read the book before I'm at yet, but I've read an article written by the author of this book. Um... His name is, uh, he's, he's from the Wharton School of Business, and his name is Adam Grant. And basically, what he says is this in his article, that why men need women. He says, female family members nudge men in generous directions. 
And the example he gives is one that you will know. Have you ever heard of Melanie and Bill Gates, the wealthiest people in all the world? Well, if Bill has obviously given away most of his money, now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, if I had that much money, I could live on this much money too. But I'll just be honest with you. I don't think most of us would. I think we'd still live on a large portion of that. Well, nevertheless, he has learned through the giving of his mother and through the heartbeat of his wife, Melinda, that they want to give and the power of giving. And what they found out in science was that actually most of uh, we men learn how to give, learn how to be generous because of the women that are in our lives. Now, I just got to tell you, I found that true. I have found that to be the case in my life. The women in my life, that relational edge that all of us, all we men need, comes from that possibility. So what did Mary do to Jesus? She had somehow given him a sense of self-respect. She developed in him a scale of values, if you would. She, had, she knew and had taught him the, the nobility of work. She had learned to, be, uh, to teach him to be considerate of others, and he discovered what we all need to, and that is the meaning of family and relationships and responsibility. It was the custom of that day that if a father passed away, and notice we do not have any word about Jesus' dad, Joseph, at least his earthly father, after about 12 years old. There is no reference anywhere in Scripture and anywhere in the story about Jesus that after 12 years old, he actually was around. So that would tell me that probably he passed away early and Jesus, as the oldest son, was given the responsibility of being in charge of the household. Now, how would you like that after about 12 years old? But somewhere along the way, he leaned into that. But what you also need to know as you follow it through with Jesus, he had some tough days too. As he began to de identify more and more with the kingdom of God, what really happened in his life? Well, do you remember the occasion where he, they said to him, where's your mother and your, and your family? And he said, this is my brothers and my sisters. And he pointed to his disciples. Now, I can just tell you that there would be a time, there was a time in my life when I came to know Christ. My mother was not a, a Christian yet. She became a Christian later in her life. And the whole idea that I was committing my life to Christ and that, that commitment was going to cause some separation in my relationship with my mother, I will be honest, it caused some real uh, concern for her. She, you know, she had always been uh, queen of my life in so many ways, because my father had died when I was so young, that she played those roles and she played them powerfully, and in most cases, strongly and well, but she didn't like necessarily finding that my life was being committed to some things that she didn't quite understand. I wonder what Jesus must have felt. There were, had to be some times in Jesus' life when he must have felt the fact that my mom is holding on to me. There is a picture, uh, Holman Hunt does a picture, it's called The Shadow of Death, and it depicts a carpenter shop in Nazareth. You'll see a portion of it there. And what, uh, it's really a much bigger picture, but I like this portion because it shows it so well. The things that I want you to notice there is that Jesus is standing up maybe like at the end of a day stretching and his mother who is, you can just see her head there, has her hand on what appears to be kind of the box or like a jewelry box where they had all the, the gifts from the Magi. And so it was on that um, picture there, uh, she was laying her hand and she's glancing up and the shadow, the sun, the setting sun that day is shooting through and it looks almost like, obviously, Jesus' arms are out, and with the wood in the background, it almost looks like the cross. Holman Hunt obviously did a lot of pictures, but this is one that I thought carried a certain uh, strong sense to me, because imagine, I mean, imagine, we don't, it's, it's, this is historically fictitious, but imagine that it could be at some point in, in her life she began to look at Jesus' life and recognize that his life was going to carry on something bigger than she ever imagined. 
And can you imagine the moment in her life when she sensed and saw what was happening and knew that ultimately the cross was going to be his destiny and how that must have played out in her life. It's called the shadow of death, and you can look it up uh, on, on the Internet. Thirdly, so we've got G, notice G, uh, Mary's keen spiritual insight. Secondly, notice Mary's deep, generous love. And, and thirdly, notice Mary's joyful, triumphant spirit. Now, how easy is it to have joy? I will tell you that joy is the most difficult part of uh, my life because I'm not naturally, you know, a glass half full guy. Uh, fortunately, that I'm married uh, a lady's glass who's almost always overflowing and so she lives with a certain sense of joy and I recognize it when I see it but I've lived long enough to know that at the end of the day uh, joy true unadulterated just real joy ultimately is the is the clearest evidence of the presence of God when you see joy you will recognize that it's the presence of God Mary said it so beautifully, just before her son was born, Mary said, one, uh, Luke 1, and my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Now imagine what she's beginning to go through, what she's beginning to recognize, what she's knowing by now, the virgin birth and all that went through in carrying out that pregnancy the shame that went along with it, that she, she, she had moved to the point of recognizing that it was joy. I wish there were more joy in our homes, don't you? I wish that parents would spend more time loving each other and their children would see that. I wish more dads would tell their children how incredibly wonderful their mothers are. I wish that more moms would take great delight in the men that they're married to and how that might uh, portray. This morning, uh, my daughter texted me early. Um, I got a friend who's in his uh, mid-70s and uh, a good close friend of mine, and he, he took the leap this week. He got a smartphone. Now, I don't know if you know what a smartphone is, but you either do or you don't. And he just could not imagine moving from his flip phone to, his, to this smartphone. And so when he sent me his first text, he said, I have moved to the 20th century. And I said, no, it's the 21st century, Phil. And so he had moved over, but there's a wonderful thing. And what I told him was, your kids will talk more to you and your grandkids will talk way more to you now that you have a smartphone. This morning, I got a text um, an hour or so before I was coming to the first service, and it was, look what my husband gave me for Mother's Day, and it was my daughter sending me a picture of this rather large uh, painting type thing, this artwork that's going to go on their wall, and it says, love lives here. And I cannot tell you what that means to me, not because it says a nice little saying, but because it is beginning to be so much the truth in that family. They have they have walked through um, the realities of two kids and jobs and, you know, Andrew, our son-in-law, is leaving for the police academy this afternoon and, you know, and just all the, the ups and downs of the goods and the bads that you stir into that. And yet I know beyond any shadow of a doubt that that, in fact, is taking place in that home. And for a father and a mother, for Neva and I to see that taking place, well, obviously... Um, there's no, nothing like it. It put me to thinking, Howard Eddington, one of my favorite preacher pastor buddies, uh, who's now retired, but uh, I went back looking for a story. Now, he never gave um, to any, res any idea where this story came from, so my bet is he wrote this story. He wrote it himself, and it goes like this. It's the story of a young mother who set her foot on the pathway of life, and she asked, is the way long? Their guide said, yes, the way is long and hard, and you will be old before you reach the end of it, but the end will be better than the beginning. And the young mother was happy, and she could not believe that anything could be better than that point in her life. So she played with her children, she gathered flowers for them along the way, she bathed them in clear streams, and she 
uh, uh, and the sun shone upon them, and life was incredibly good. The young mother said nothing could be better than this. Then night came, and a storm broke, and the path was dark, and the children shook with fear and cold. The mother drew them close and covered them with her arms, and the children said, Mother, we are not afraid because you are near. And the mother said, This is better than the, than the brightness of the day, for I have taught my children courage. The morning came, and there was a hill ahead, and the children climbed, and they grew weary, and the mother was weary too, but she kept saying to the children, Keep climbing, we'll be there soon, keep climbing. And so the children climbed, and when they reached the top, they said, We couldn't have done it without you. The mother thought to herself, This is a better day than the last, for my children have learned fortitude in the face of difficulty. Yesterday I gave them courage, and today I have given them strength. The next day, the dark clouds hovered over the earth, and there were clouds of war and hatred and evil. And the children groped and stumbled on their way, but mother said, look up, lift up your eyes for the light. And the children looked and saw above the clouds an everlasting glory, and it guided them beyond the darkness. And the mother said, this is the best day of my life, for I have shown my children of God. Days moved on. The mother grew old, and she was small and bent. But her children were tall and straight and strong. When the way was rough, they carried her. She was light as a feather. And at last they came to a hill, and beyond the hill was a shining road and a golden gate flung open. And the mother said, I have reached the end of my journey, and now I know it is true that the end is better than the beginning, for my children can walk with God their children after them and the children said you will always be with us mother and they stood and they watched her as she went on alone and the gates closed after her and the children said we cannot see her but she is with us still I read that story and uh, obviously it has so much symbol uh, and truth in it Maybe I'm old enough now to recognize the incredible power of that story. And so I ask you, is that the story of Jesus' mother? Maybe. Is that the story of your mother? I hope so. Maybe that's the story of my mother. I certainly saw some parallels. Maybe it's the story of you who are mothers this morning. As I dealt with this message this week, I kept trying to think, okay, I need to be able to say it in one line or it doesn't make sense. And the line that I kept coming up with was this, family love and loyalties have an unbelievably important place in all of our lives. But they flourish best when they're under the higher love and loyalty of God. Today, we celebrate mothers but at the end of the day, we are celebrating relationships and how one relationship with God can change our relationship with others in a way that we become influencers. When I see the children, I think about what we're building into them. When I see how we rub our lives together, putting out mulch and doing life together, I think about how we rub our lives together to do something more than we can do by ourselves. The beauty of a simple story of a mother is that we learn about every part of her. Everybody has a mother, good, bad, or indifferent. We all have somebody who birthed life into us, and now we have a chance to have new life birthed 